after that, for some time, I, because of my family moved to a different area in Canada, uh, I worked in a, in a center that was quite large. We had 100 rooms and we hosted programs for uh, adult education. So they were not degree programs, but they were occasional programs in peace studies, in ecology, and for, it was more community work. And I worked there for about 12 years, so I enjoyed that kind of work as well. Right. Can you understand me all right? Yeah. Yes. Is it okay? Well, yeah? If, if, if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know. No? Okay. So I, now I live in a very uh, rural area of Canada, very, not in a city, but in the countryside. Canada is very unusual. I think 85% of the people live in the cities and only 15% live in the rural areas. But I heard in Tamil Nadu recently, almost 50% now live in cities. Is that true? Yes. yes. It's, a, it's increasing very much. And I think throughout India, that's uh, a trend. So that's one thing that I, is important that, to talk about is urbanization and the effect on rural life. Um, when I first came to India four, four years ago, I came because I met a man named Rajagopal, do you, you know a little bit about him? Yeah? Yes. Sh or should I explain? Yeah? No, sir. Okay. So, uh, and I traveled uh, uh, quite a bit with Rajagopal, and I was very interested in the nonviolence work that he was doing, the empowerment training in villages. Um, just last week, he was here, and we went to two small villages, Adabasi villages, about two hours from Madurai. So, what I saw there was very painful to see. Um, so some in, the, in the first village it was, I think, 16 tribal families who had been moved out of the, the forest, mm -hmm. the mountain where they were living, and the government had built some concrete houses for them, but now the houses were falling apart, and they weren't allowed to go back into the forest. They wanted to go back and collect produce in the forest, and that was... Uh, so it was a very painful situation. In Canada, we also have this situation with our indigenous peoples. Um, what happened there was that many of them were forced to go uh, f away from their villages and go for education in the cities. Mm -hmm. So, and they were taken away from their families, they lost their language. So now we, we have what's called a Truth and Reconciliation Committee, just like they had in South Africa. We have the same in Canada for the native peoples to, to, ex to talk about their experience. And it's, it's had a very positive effect um, throughout the country. People are more aware. The population of native people in Canada is very small, not like India, maybe, maybe one or two percent, so it's a very small number. Um, but they, native communities are now rebuilding themselves, so uh, they've become very active, and they've recovered some of their traditions that were lost. That's one very important source, and I think in India, too, it's the same. There's a lot of pressure on small villages and on Adivasi communities or Dalit communities to, to urbanize, to modernize, um, and to become part of the mainstream economy. So this is one of the things that I'm very interested in. Is, how, is it possible to preserve traditional culture in the way Gandhi imagined, in the village culture? And how do we do that? It's a, it's a problem here in India. It's also a problem in Canada where you know, young people are all attracted to the cities. So I have four children. All of them have moved away from where I live to work in the cities. That's just very typical. <coughs> so that's one thing I want to talk about. Um, another thing is the, the difference between West and East. Um, so uh, this is something I've been trying to understand. I've been traveling back and forth between India and Canada. When I'm in India, I, I have to admit, I'm in love with India. I love to be here. I love the culture. I love the traditions. Uh, then I go back to Canada and I think, hmm, why are we living like this? We have such a different, yet we have such a different culture there. So I'm struggling to understand the differences and how, what, what we can do about those differences. So that's another thing. Then I also met Dr. Jay Prakasham, and we have become good friends. So I've learned, been learning a lot from him in the last few years, and reading more and more of Gandhi. And now I'm trying to say, how do we how do we read Gandhi in the West? I'm curious how you read Gandhi in India, 
But as a Westerner in, in Canada or the United States or in Europe, what does Gandhi mean there? And what is the context for reading Gandhi? That's a very big problem, I think. Um, because most of the time Gandhi is just regarded as a, a historical figure. Interesting but not important anymore, you know, in the West. Just someone from the past. Uh, so that's very sad that that is the way. There are some people in the West, though, who have been from the beginning very interested in Gandhi and they took him very seriously. So one person uh, was a man named Thomas Merton, who was a Catholic monk, uh, who read Gandhi very carefully during the time of the Vietnam War in the 1960s. And he tried to translate Gandhi's ideas into the culture of America at that time. And he had a, he had a very uh, a, a profound impact in, in the United States because of what he did. He was a peace activist in a very difficult time during the Vietnam War. So there is still a tradition of peace activism. One of the young men who is staying with us at Cheshi right now is, uh, I wish I'd brought him along this morning, he's a young man from Canada as well. He belonged to a group called Christian Peacemaker Teens. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they go into areas where there's conflict, so they go into Palestine, they go um, into um, several areas, and they try to, to accompany the people who are the victims, who are the weaker ones, so to be a witness so that the powerful people don't overwhelm the weaker ones. 